Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus, and I thank you so much for today. I thank you, Lord, for being able to be here in the service and worship with the saints. God, it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for touching our hearts, Lord. We could not be here unless you called us, oh God. We could not be here unless you gave us the desire to seek your face. Lord, I pray for those that are here, those that wanted to be here but could not be here. Lord, I pray for them, oh God. Deal with this all today, Lord. I pray that you'd use me, Lord, to speak to your children, oh God. We don't want to hear my voice. We want to hear your voice through me. So, Jesus, I pray that you would just break away that hardness and that callow, calloused heart, oh God. And I pray that you'd renew a right spirit in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, first, I just want to give honor to God. It's a blessing to be here in the house of the Lord. I want to honor my wife and my son in their absence. They are out in California, Santa Monica. I don't know. I'm pretty sure they're not having as much fun as we are. <laughs> no, we had some family. She just went out to visit. She should be back this evening. But um, it's just a blessing to be here. It's actually, um, the Lord has really been putting some things on my heart. A few um, months ago, about three or four months ago, I was in Gallup. And... Uh, I had actually spoke a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to go a different direction today, but I'm going to bring up a few things. It was about three or four months ago, I was driving, and I pulled up, and I seen one of these old school, you know, um, you know, like cars and everything, and they were playing a song in there. And I drove up listening to this heathen, and that heathen was playing um, Ludacris. And it was as... You know, you move, I move just like that. And I was sitting there and I was like, wow. You know, sitting there listening and I was hip and hopping. I was like, what happened? And something took me back real quick. And I was like, Jesus, I thank you that you love me despite that heathenism that just jumped in me. But from that same idea, I had a spoken message in Gallup. And those of you who are out there, right? And I, and I talked about when God moves. Or when we move, God moves just like that. And I preach about that. But I want to talk on a few... Uh, topics from that before we get to our message today but you know I was thinking about this idea and I was looking at scripture is that really true and I start seeing it jump off the page in everywhere like literally there is a part that we play and God has willed it that way it's so important that we really don't just sit back and keep Christianity as a spectator sport it is a participating and you have to participate to activate what God is doing. And so many of us are like, I know it. I've been praying. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. And nothing's not happening. And I really believe that God wants you to know that when you move, he will move. And we see this over and over through scripture. I started work first with the idea from Matthew chapter 6 when he gives us the model on how to pray. And he says in the prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's where it just, I just took off. Because I'm thinking we pray that everybody knows that. Everybody in the Christian faith, no matter what um, background, what denomination, they know that. They pray it, they recite it, they believe in that. The Lord is teaching his disciples how to pray. But then I just start thinking about it. I said, why would God call us to pray for his kingdom to come if it's going to come with or without us it's going to come regardless why would he charge us to do this thing it made no sense and i started thinking about it and he started showing me god for whatever reason has given us a responsibility in his work he has given us a part that we play and i think it's important saints that we play our part so god will play his part and I started looking at more verses. I got to Matthew 18, verse 18. He says that same idea. Assuredly, I say unto you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose on heaven. And we read this, like, oh, what's all that saying? So I got a different version. And it says, whatever you imprison. Why does it, what would that have to do anything with us? God, this is your work. I can, you mean, I read scripture and it says I couldn't even come into God unless he put that desire in my heart. So what is this whole idea that I actually play a part, that we all, as the church of the living God, play a part? That whenever we imprison, God will imprison. Whatever you set free, God will set free. And that's where I had that message, when you move, God moves, just like that. If I had this song, I'd play it now, so I should play that. <laughs> 
re, the revised version of it. All along, we've been waiting on God, but God has been waiting on us. And I continue to see this jump out the Bible all over the place. I looked at James chapter 4, and in verse 8, we get this singular idea. Draw near to God. That's your part. And he will draw near to you. I was like, what? This is all over the place. God is literally working in his people, trying to get us off of our laziness, get us off our behind, and really let the kingdom of God come. We sit back and we look at all of what's going on, and that's why sometimes, guys, I don't think we're getting there. I'm not trying to down on us, but we really got to take prayer up a notch. There is so much going on, and we sit back like, I hope the police come and do something about this. I hope they raise a law. And do, guys, you realize we're trying to rely on humanism and human power and human strength to take care of stuff when God has actually put this responsibility on his people. Did he not say, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray? This is a responsibility that we have. And every one of us should take hold of that responsibility. Amen. We sit back, we watch, man, the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. And we sit back, but at least we're all right. I'm going to, is that really what God wants? Man, we think about the Jews, how they hid the light. Are we becoming like the Jews? And we're happy that we have this whole light of the glory of God, but we see a dying world. So the idea that God is continually placing on me, guys, we've got to catch a burden. We gotta catch a burden for our community. We gotta catch a burden for our land. Pastor Walt said it when we were praying today, let's pray for our nation. Guys, this has to be the upfront of our heart. We sit back, I mean, with all of what's going on, I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised, man, if we had like a civil war breakout next month. Just to see all of what's happening in the streets, the things that are going on, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go back to a curfew, do you? Nobody wants to go back to all of these other ideas and these possibilities of like martial law. Like, no, we don't want that. But I'm just gonna wait it out and see what happens. That's not what we're supposed to do. If the saints begin to pray for the Lord to have his way, the glory of the Lord will definitely come on down. We got to, got to, got to pray. You can sit there all you want, but God won't draw near to you until you first draw near to God. You must first do your part, then God will do his part. When you move, God moves. He even goes on in verse 10 and he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he, doesn't you have a song that goes, <laughs> and he, will lift you up. Every one of us, we want to be lifted up. But that's not our part. That's God's part. Our part is to humble ourselves. Right. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. You know, we really, really got to capture hold of what God is calling each and every one of us to do. So as I put those thoughts and those ideas, I want us to go in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. I have titled the message for today, Vision for 2020. Vision for 2020. Joshua chapter 3. Verse 1. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and he lodged there before it was over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 years. I'm sorry, 2,000 cubits, sorry. But I know, <laughs> maybe that wasn't an, uh, it was an accident, that was purpose. Listen, 1,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it. 
that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. We'll stop right here for a second. God is trying to take us all to a place, a place that we have never been before. But he can't take you there if you keep on doing what you've been doing. Sometimes it takes a different path, a different move, a different place, a different building for us to fall in line with the things of God. I know it might be scary. I know that we are used, or they were used to being in Egypt. They were used to being a slave. They were used to being in their rut. They got comfortable in their lives they were living. They got comfortable in their relationships. They got comfortable in their job. But God says he wants to take us to a place that our feet have never walked before. A place where our ears have never heard of before. A place that our eyes have never seen before. I want to take you to the land that you've never seen. I want to take you to a deep place in my spirit that you've never known before. But why would you want to move if you couldn't see it? If you couldn't grasp it? If you couldn't perceive it? If I was blindfolded and I wanted to make any moves, I wouldn't want to move if I was blindfolded. Somebody, I'm just sitting there blindfolded. I wouldn't want to just step down. I wouldn't want to do that. It would be very catastrophous. Or could, there would be a lot of things that I, I could go through. Sorry, I just said a word. <laughs> Making up words, I'll do that all day long. It would be a catastrophe with me moving in that way. That sound a little better? Je puis le dire en français? Tu le préfères? Non, c'est Let's just go on and then we're <laughs> C'est une catastrophe. Anyways, if I were blindfolded, it wouldn't be a good thing. And this is the whole idea, but it's funny. You could take the same blindfoldedness and someone guided me that I trust and I'd be all right. I would be able to grasp it as long as I could trust an individual. And it's a whole dramatic different scenario. See, a lot of us, I'm noticing it's difficult to get moving. For example, you know, I shouldn't even say this, but today I was praying over someone. And when I was praying over someone, there was an ungodly, demonic, blood-sucking demon on their back. Now, you guys went too far. It was a bed bug. But what happened was, I seen it, and I said, I wonder if I showed this person. They probably would have fell out, and y'all would have thought it was the spirit. You were like, look how the Holy Ghost moving on them. But it was so, and I was going to make the drama out of it. I said, you know what? Let me just be calm and collective, right? There's a camera. You want to act the fool? Because I talk about him. I didn't want to even touch the thing. And I said, I went with the lands. Ooh, no, I ain't going to touch him. What's going on there? But what's funny, to, what's funny about that? I'm so sorry. About this. Out of sight, out of mind, he didn't have no difference. If I could have left it and act like I didn't see it, like I ain't touching that. They would have had no difference. You hear what I'm saying? The fact that they couldn't see what was going on, they were cool, calm, and collective. Crying at the altar. I didn't know this, but no, I mean, I was leaving it all. How many of us are in that place? We can't see spiritually what God is doing, and we're just cool, calm, and collective. Well, I don't know anybody that lives in any hurricane-type areas. I've been in Jamaica. Man, I'm going to tell you this. There's always a calm before the storm. It's so easy for us to get into this mode where we're out of touch with the vision that God has. We're out of touch with what God's doing. So you couldn't even tell the difference if you had blood-sucking demons. And I should use that one, because that's true. And now these days, that's a reality. All type of demonic powers running around, and we have no clue or no difference because we're not keeping track in sight of the vision. Let's continue to go on in Joshua 3. I'm going to look at verse 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day 
I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I like how there's nothing in the Bible accidentally. Lift him up in the sight. He could have did that in secret. Did nobody have to know? But God particularly wanted to make a move in the sight of the people. He said, let your light so shine before all men that they would see your good works. When they see your good works, what do you say in Matthew 5, 16? They would glorify God who is in heaven. God is doing things. Many times we have to capture sight of what God is doing. Otherwise, why would you want to move? Why would you want to move? We must realize we're in a day and age where God desires to take us to a new place. Do you know, I love the story of them coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land. Now they're under Joshua and they're about to cross the Jordan. They're literally on the brink of receiving what God has been promising them for over 400 years. I mean, they can see it, they can just taste it. But just because they were so close, they had everything in their sight, there were still some battles that they had to fight. There were still some things they had to go through. They had to learn to keep their mind on the things of God. There were so many distractions in the land, even in that time. Sometimes the distraction is not just the beauty of like, oh, I felt so crawl up me. I go, lie, boy. Y'all gonna see me act a fool. What you gonna do? And I was like, <laughs> whoa, that was just a string. It's okay, it was just a string. Anyway, so I look at this stuff. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Thank you, Jesus. I just gotta stop and pray. Thank you, Lord. Guys, this is important. Do we literally realize that God is on the move? See, distraction is not only just, oh, look at the fruits, look at the, you know, milk and honey. Sometimes we can get distracted with our problems. Look how bad this is. Look how bad this and that is. Look at that giant, look at this opposition. Guys, we have to lay hold of what God is doing. It's difficult. We all go through this. It's easy to get caught up with the opposition. What are you doing, Lord? I know you're on the move. You got to learn to zero in to Jesus and zero out of everything else, especially in the days like this. Have you ever talked to a person and you say, how you're doing? And you could feel, you could perceive in your spirit they're not doing okay. And they turn to you and you say, oh, I'm all right. And you say, okay, well, I guess I said, I'm going to walk on. Or do you burden with that person? Say, you know what? Let's just go talk or let's pray or let's do something. As simple as it was for you to determine in your spirit that they weren't okay, though they may look okay. I love sometimes when people, you know, they take up, they come back and, you know, like they'll come and greet Mr. Wayne. Hey, Mr. Wayne, I'm doing good. I graduated the program. Man, I got an apartment. And you're like, wow, who are you living with? I love Miss Louise. She's just, I love Mama Louise. Man, she'll get right to the heart of the issue in a very good two minutes. With two, you just give her two minutes of your time, we'll get to the heart of the issue. Yeah, you're, you're, the Lord has blessed you. Man, you're living, who are you living with? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm living with my girlfriend or I'm living with my boyfriend. She's like, oh, really? You mean you haven't gotten married yet? Oh, really? And then she just wrote, this is, this is not even, this is 30 seconds into the, this is 30 seconds into the conversation. And where are you going to church at, may I ask? Oh, well, you know. Oh, well, you know, I went by the church the other day. Yeah, you know, I think they had a, a social. And I went by, but you know, there was no parking spots. So, so, you know, COVID, and I, there was not enough spaces, so I just had to leave. Now that's one minute into the conversation, and then here it comes. Here's her left hook spiritually. That ain't good at all. <laughs> what part of good is you? There's nothing good about you shacking up. You ain't going to church. Man, 
I love talking to Miss Wynn. I worked, I worked with Miss Wynn for one year. Man, that was some of the best days of my life. She would just give me a hook. And you know, that ain't right. I remember one time I got an attitude with someone, and I'm looking for her to back me up. Miss Louise, you didn't see them get crazy with me? She said, that ain't godly. <laughs> what? I just sat here. You know what got mad with me? You need to quit being immature. Miss Louise, can I get a break? Yeah, you need to take a break and get with Jesus because you ain't acting right. Yeah. I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. We need the truth and the truth will set us free. Amen. It's so easy for us to lose sight. God, what did you call me here for? You called me to deliver me, to set me free, to put me on track with you, to make a real relationship with you. And now I got a relationship with everything and everyone else but the Lord. Did we miss something? The Lord wanted to exalt Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, that they would know as he was with Moses, so is the, he with Joshua. And then look at verse 8, Joshua 3, verse 8. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Take a moment and talk about that edge. I like the edge. Standing at the edge. The water's right here. Standing at the edge is not good enough. Who would want to walk out on an edge that they couldn't see? You have to be able to see the edge or see where you're going to approach it. Some of us have made it so far that you can taste the victory. You've been hanging on for so long and you're getting tired. You fought and you fought and you fought and you want to know, when is it going to be my turn? When is it my turn, Lord? When will I get my breakthrough? When will I get my raise? When will I get my husband? When will I get my wife? When will I get my kids, kids back? When, Lord? When, Lord? God says you're standing at the edge. You are at the brink. You're at the very tip. But be careful because you haven't made it yet. Have you ever stood at the edge of a wall? At the very tip of it? It's funny because at the tip of a wall, a high wall at that, if it's a very crucial point in time. It's a place where you can fall while at the same time it's a place where you could cross over. You'll get the one that you pay attention to the most. Do you focus so much on failing? Or are you focusing so much on winning and obeying the Lord? You must be careful You've been fighting so long that you can easily, easily lose sight on what you're fighting for. What and why would be a reason why people would stay at the edge? Why? We're almost there. You're about to make it. This is 400 years in the making. Maybe they wanted to test out the water, see if it was hot or cold. Maybe they wanted to check if there was any fishes in it, if there was turtles, and maybe they wanted to check. Yesterday we went up over to some water. Boy, there was this standing at the brink, and then I got one crazy assistant said, I'm jumping in. I was like, I don't think you can do that here. This is not a place to jump in at. He was ready though. Sometimes we need those type of personalities. Huh? I wasn't, he's already wet, you know? You're not just supposed to go in there, but see, we have to be careful because my point is, if they would have stayed there, this is the whole point. If they would have just stayed there looking, 
waiting for God to do something, nothing would have ever happened. They would have never made it across to the other side, just standing at the edge. God's command was never to stand at the edge. His command was to go across unto the other side. So many of us, we just like coming to the edge of things. And then we give up. It's like it's a comfort, man. Well, I was, I tell you, man, you could go and start something. It's easy to start a fight, isn't it not? But it's not always easy to end it. And we get into this place where we're so quick to get to this. We have the affinity of not finishing stuff. Guys, we gotta not just make it to the end of something or to the edge. We gotta follow through and go all the way to the end. I think to myself, what if Jesus made it to the cross and said, you know what, I think this is a good place to stop. Yeah. Absolutely not. He went all, all, all the way. God didn't quit on us. Let's not quit on him. Being at the brink is not good enough. Standing at the edge is not good enough. And before I move on, I want to read verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come up from the upstream and they shall stand in a heap. And I love this. Again, jumping right off the pages, guys. The priests had to do their part. If they would have not first placed their feet within the Jordan River, nothing would have happened. See, the scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Because they that come to God must believe that God is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, every one of us, we want the reward. But the scripture is very clear. You got to seek him diligently first. Then the reward comes as a response. God is responding. He's responding. And that's why we have to really capture hold of his vision. The scripture says in Proverbs 29 verse 18, that where there is no vision, the people perish. We must get a vision for 2020. You say, what are you talking about? We're almost done with 2020. You should, this ain't the new year. You know, this is actually was the Hebrew year just a minute ago. But, you know, sometimes what happens is, guys, yeah, you may have started off, oh, January, I'm going to lose weight. Well, where are you at now? You clearly lost sight of how big your belly is. <laughs> we lose track of things along the way. And ultimately, I believe God is calling us. We need to gain track on what's going on. See, this whole year has been a catastrophe. <laughs> it is easy to just stop what we're doing and play by somebody else's beat. It's easy when a catastrophe going, oh, I had all these plans, but I got to put it on hold. I got to put this aside. And then what happens is we lose track of what God is intending and calling us to do. You know, I really love in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. As a result, they do not see the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Christ who is in God's image. We think about that, but that is the devil's desire. He wants to cloud up our mind. He wants to literally get us to a place where we would not see. And I love that verse because it shows this thing. Guys, it's easy to get off track. It's easy to get those thoughts and those ideas that distract us away from what God is trying to do in our lives. We have to get back the focus. We have to get back the vision of God for 2020. Guys, the times are going to continue to get heated. Like, Don't act like you don't realize it. 
check your spirit. Things are going bad. But also determine that the works of God is still progressing mightily now than I even believe than ever before. But if we don't capture that right vision and sight, we'll miss it. I have 15 minutes left, and I want to go with the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Kings chapter 6. It's actually a favorite of mine, and I want to read a little bit of it. And I want you to grasp hold of what God is speaking through these verses. I'm going to start reading in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, see, it's always about a war, keep that in mind, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king, so they would be on the alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is a traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha the prophet is in Israel. He tells the king of Israel even the words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is. The king commanded, so I can send troops and seize them. And the report came back, Elisha's at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up the next morning, he went outside. There were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now, the young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Let's stop right there. I want you to play, I want you to pay close attention. What I like about this story is that the entire time, the whole time all of this was going on, Elisha could see it. The help was already there, even though the servant couldn't see it. The entire time, oh, he's running around worried. What am I going to do? The entire time, the help was already there. How many of us have already received our help? But maybe we just can't see it. Maybe because God is using a person or a message that we don't want to hear, so we reject it. Just because you cannot see it does not mean it is not there. I want you to capture this thing. They didn't get a vision because they sought a vision. They got this vision of these angels that protected them and watch over them because they sought the Lord. I love it. They said, oh Lord, open up his eyes. They didn't see. See, it's so easy that I'm saying capture a vision. So immediately, like, oh, I got to get a vision. So you're thinking about what vision am I going to get? No, you've already missed it. We need to get a hold of the Lord. He is the one that gives the vision. Some of us, we need money. Oh, I know what. I'll go get a job. No. You need to seek the Lord. I need a home. Oh, I know. I'll go get a house. No. You need to seek the Lord. Church of New Buildings, go get new buildings. No. We need to seek the Lord. If you need a partner, oh, I know, I'll just go get a man, I'll go get a woman. No, we need to seek the Lord. A vision for 2020 doesn't come from better glasses, doesn't come from better lenses, doesn't come from the optometrists. 
I love it. I got 20-20 vision. You can't see a thing. Them bifocals ain't doing nothing for you. God is on the move, but can you see it? A vision for 2020 comes from one place and one place alone. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's funny because, you know, I like when I read stories like this. You know, I try to check the background. Elisha was just like how he has his servant. His first servant is tripping out. Don't know what to do. Well, there was a time not too long ago that Elisha was a servant to someone named Elijah. Can't imagine how many times he was probably tripping out. I'm leaving. Now I am going to follow you. I'm leaving. Now I'm going to keep on following you. Well, give me a double portion then. <laughs> When I read this story, it's almost like, you know, I already know the story, but I go back and I think. It's like, like I never read this story before and I'm reading and I'm like, ooh, what is Elisha about to do? He's in the middle of trouble. Man, if he's anything like his teacher Elijah, I know exactly what he's gonna do. Army come against me. There's a story about Elijah. He got a, it wasn't even the great army, it was just 50 men. He says, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall. So I read this story, I'm like, man, Elisha is clearly going to call down fire. and He's going to handle this. Man, if I was that servant and I was like, Elisha, oh man, it's about to be on like Donkey Kong. He's about to be just like his teacher was and burn everybody. Up. Oh, this is going to be bad. Let me step back. Yeah, Elisha, what we going to do? He didn't mean what we going to do. Well, Elisha, what you going to do? Because I'm going to stand back here and watch what you're going to do. But I love this. Remember, he had a double portion. I like this thing about a double portion because it's almost like whatever he would have did would have honestly probably just been stronger in essence or more powerful. It would have been a double portion of this response. So maybe one portion, we would have burnt him up. But the double portion, watch what he did. Out of everything that Elisha could have done, he could have prayed for a legion to come down. He could have prayed for whirlwind to take everybody away. He could have prayed for the earth. All, all type of stuff he could have prayed for. I want you to capture what happened. In the spirit, a double portion. He knew that the power to overcome the enemy was in the power of him to see. He prayed in a situation not to destroy. He could have killed everybody there. He prayed that his eyes would be opened. Guys, we're living in a day and everybody's in this great sleep and this great slumber. I see people walking around and they, I got to just sign in and check it. Their eyes aren't even open. They may physically have their eyes open, but spirit, spiritually they're still asleep. We're living in a day and age, guys. We're surrounded by principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. They're literally right before us, just intervening and destroying everything. And we're just standing back like, oh, everything's okay. I pray that we get the sight to see. We're living in a perilous time. It's so easy to get all this government money and this and that. Oh, we're good. Everything's going all right. Guys, you can see the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> Things are wrapping up as we speak. Sometimes I look and it's like the stars don't even shine like they used to. I don't even want to, I'm going to not. <laughs> Do we have the sight to see? Or will, I tell you, this situation, there would have been no way out humanly. Humanly, there was no way out. Dothan was on a hill, and the great army most likely would have surrounded that hill. 
there would have been no way humanly possible for them to be able to advance the enemy. Guys, you're going to be, if you're not already, in a situation where you feel that presence, where you feel that enemy just bum-rushing you, you're going to have to learn to get the sight that the Lord gives. I sit back and I watch some of what Pastor Walden, now that I'm going through, and I would always wonder, how could he just step out of it? Like everything's all right. The problem didn't even, it's still right there, we gotta deal with it. And I used to think that, you know what, he's just off to leave, he's just not dealing with the issue. But I realized something. I'm like that silly servant. Pastor Walt, what are we gonna do? And he just sits back and he's like, let God be God. And I think about it, is it that? Is it that he's focusing in on the Lord while I'm worrying about every problem and trouble that is opposing? I mean, I just think about the goodness and how he's literally just putting pieces together that no one could have put together. Humanly, if we went in our human strength, just like if Elisha would have went in his human strength, he would have been subdued by the enemy. There was no way out. But all the while, the help was there. I think about everyone in their individual's situation. They're going to stand to your feet. Everyone stand to your feet. And I think about this. Every one of us, we have these problems that we're facing. We have these situations that we're going through. And we get all worked up. Just think about to the last time when you had something you were going through that you didn't see no way out. You didn't think it was going to work. You did everything in your human strength to make it work. And it still didn't work. But then God made a way out of no way. I feel like if he's done it before, will he not do it again? We're sitting here in this time Guys, there's no way humanly I or any of us is going to be able to thwart some of the forces and the things that will happen. But we will overcome. Because we don't go in our strength, but we go in the Lord's. But I am a strong believer. The sight to see had to be given first. I believe sometimes, guys, we don't realize. Pay attention to what you're looking at. You know, we talk about a story how 3.5 million people gave up the promised land. And it was basically what they chose to focus on. They focused on how much opposition was coming against them. How big the fortified cities were. How great and mighty were the giants in the land. And with simply that focus, and that focus alone, they avoided receiving what God had already prepared for every one of them. Is it possible that we're doing that here, now, and today? God has promised to do it. He has promised and he is faithful to bring forth his word. He watches over it that it be performed. But maybe we're focusing, well, I relapsed the last time I tried. I didn't make it, or he is right at the brink. God says, will you focus on me this time? Will you really put everything else aside and focus on me? He is the one that determines the outcome of every battle. Church, we must be the church that God is calling for these end days. I think about it, it's like there's not been a time like you see all of the crazy people right here in the church. <laughs> but you know what? It's because craziness in the world, it's going to take craziness to come against it, but crazy for Jesus. We sit back here and God is literally putting it all together and raising up a people who are unafraid. He will use us but we've got to get a hold of his vision maybe you're still stuck on your own personal idea your own personal vision you know i think about some of the battles i fought recently and the more and more i 
stop lying to myself. I realized I was battling my personal vision. I didn't want to let it go. I'm talking about it was about a month ago, I had a very, very difficult battle. I was seeing, I was looking, but I was stuck on what I wanted to do. I was stuck on my own idea in my own ways. But the vision of God it was tormenting me, it was haunting me. And the battle I'm talking about played out in all types of unnecessary things. But I guess what am I concluding is maybe some of you, that's exactly where you're at. You feel torn on the inside. And it's because you haven't let go of your personal vision. You haven't let go of what you want to do. I started out this thing, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe it's time to stop being torn in two. Let go of that thing and say, God, I'll fully take hold of your vision. I'll fully take hold of what you want me to do.